Tonight we're going to begin the 29th chapter of Genesis. This will be our 48th lesson. Begins uh, quite a spiritual saga of Jacob and Rachel. A number of very wonderful types and figures in this, as well as our continued acquaintance with the ways of God. <clears throat> we'll be reviewing the first 20 verses of chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence are ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said unto them, Is he well? They said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it's high day. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. They said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. While he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. Amen. <clears throat> now we're seeing something develop in these texts of Genesis. And I wanted to say a word about it. We've mentioned this before, but I want to underscore it. That for those in Christ, our concept of history is shaped by the revealed working of God. And we should not let the world cause us to think of history in another, in another light. A lot had been going on in the world during the times we're reviewing. But so far as the inspired records is concerned, those things aren't mentioned. They're hidden in the genealogies 
of the people who were not chosen of God. Those would include Ham, Japheth, the six sons of Keturah, and Esau, together with Ishmael. All these world happenings are hidden in those genealogies of the people who weren't chosen. They aren't mentioned, they're hidden in those genealogies. Because as far as God's purpose is concerned, they had no significance. They may have had a lot of significance in the shaping of society and that sort of thing in the world. But they weren't significant from God's purpose. Now I've given a, a brief history from Abraham to our text in what follows. And the things that are italics are things that didn't pertain to God's purpose. And you, if you go through, you'll see there was like significant things happened. But they weren't mentioned in Scripture. So you can't let yourself be unduly impressed. Yeah, see, by those things. Yeah. Now this is sort of a spiritual science, if I may use that word. That when it comes to understanding things, you, you want your mind to be shaped by what God did, not what man did. Amen. <clears throat> it, it isn't not any wonder then that the things that aren't italicized are left out of their That's history right. books. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. See, these days there's an expression called world view. It, you know, they just started using it in recent decade or so. Now it's become quite a common word in religious circles. What is your world view? And people, maybe people think that word is actually in the Bible. It's not. So I thought I want to deal briefly with it because this is why the scriptures don't look at things with a world view in mind. By definition, what is a, what is a world view? By definition, it's a comprehensive world view is the fundamental cognitive orientation of an individual or society encompassing the entirety of the individual or society's knowledge and point of view, including natural philosophy, fundamental, existential, and normative postulates or themes, values, emotions, and ethics. Or as Webster puts it, the way someone thinks about the world. Collins' Dictionary says a person's worldview is the way they see and understand the world, especially regarding issues such as politics, philosophy, and religion. That's a worldview. Now, the, the fatal error of the worldview is that it combines area of, areas of knowledge that can't be homogenized. Yeah. Nikki, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> huh? We had to cancel our trip. Oh. <laughs> All right, we are going to go ahead then, brother. <laughs> 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 the worldview combines bodies of knowledge that can't be homogenized or blended together. Yeah. They fall, these bodies of knowledge fall into the category of what scriptures call the imaginations of the thoughts. Mm -hmm. They're not valid right. realms of knowledge. Yeah. So if a worldview has to do with our view of them, our view of them is they're not valid. Yeah. The manner in which history is covered by the scriptures confirms this is the case. God just glosses over what the world considers great significant bodies of knowledge, so it's philosophy, so forth. It's a body of knowledge. And it just glosses over them. Why? Because they don't, they're temporal, mm -hmm. which automatically places them at the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. Whatever's going to pass away cannot become your emphasis. Amen. That's right. It cannot be what you look at or what, or what you make your decisions by. And the way, the way Scripture covers these periods of time confirm that this is the case. For instance, 
the greatest philosophers of all time by the world's definition were Socrates, his primary student Plato, whose primary student was Socrates, <coughs> was Aristotle. And they all lived a long time before Christ. In fact, they lived in the interim between Malachi and John the Baptist. But none of them are in any way referenced in Scripture. Why not? Because their knowledge was not valid knowledge. Whatever, whatever they said that may have had a ring of truth in it, it was almost like accident. It was like Balaam's ass speaking. Like Socrates said that man is comprised of a seen and an unseen part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He figured that out. Yeah. <laughs> he figured that out just the worldly wisdom. And there's people that they don't still have trouble with that. But that, that's something that was obvious to him. Uh -huh. yeah. But see, his view of seen and unseen is not in Scripture because he was philosophizing. He was guessing. Yeah, that's right. People of tender heart are sensitive about these things. That's why when they're exposed, whether in education or some other thing, they're exposed to the wisdom of the world, it, it rubs them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You kind of sense that there's something here that's defective, and whatever part of it is, is valid for temporal use, we're just going to use it. We aren't going to abuse it. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> now, having said that, let's get to this text. Jacob has had his dream, you remember, at Bethel. He's traveled a number of miles, as many as 600, and he's arrived where there's a well in a field. Interesting, you remember that when Abraham sent his servant out to find a wife for Isaac, he, he ended up at a well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they fed sheep, watered sheep also. Now, a lot's happened at a well in scriptures a source of water that sustains life. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned a few of them. Hagar's eyes were opened at a well. See, see a well. Mm -hmm. She named the well, and it became a reference point for travelers. Mm -hmm. Abraham reproved Abimelech because his servants had taken a well that he dug for them. See, wells were significant in Scripture. Yeah, that's right. Abraham made a covenant with Abimelech at a well. Abraham's servant found a wife for Isaac at a well. The herdmen at Gerar, they contended with Isaac over a well. Wells were so critical, they contended, fought over whose well was this going to be that Isaac dwelt, uh, dug. Now Jacob, he has an experience at a well. So God's shaping, kind of adding to our nomenclature, to our, to our vocabulary, well, he's going to add that because he's going to talk to us through the prophets. He's going to talk to us this kind of language. He'll say, with joy shall I draw water out of the wells. Mm -hmm. See, so he's, developing, he's building a, so you get an idea of what wells are. You don't, want to, you don't want to read that with today's wells in mind. Yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> you dig, you pay a couple thousand dollars, dig a well in your backyard. You don't want that. That's not the kind of well we're talking about yeah. here. We're talking about a well where flocks are watered. And again, uh, the scriptures say, Whoso Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the well that I shall give him shall be in him. A well. Mm -hmm. A well of water springing up under everlasting life. See, he's building this. this. This kind of well we're going to have here is a springing well. Yeah, amen. It's not a well with the water way down, you lower a bucket down. It's not that kind of well. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not that kind of well. There's a well you got to draw out of, and there's a well it springs out of. So we're talking about a springing, yeah, amen. springing well. The saints of God have got to be refreshed, mm -hmm. but it can only be by things that are fresh. Amen. You can't refresh God's saint by rehearsing stagnant things. Mm -hmm. That's not what does it. It has to be a living water. Fresh, fresh living water is fresh springing. Yes, amen. Water, which by very nature is cool as compared to water from a river. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is uh, rather tepid and filthy yeah. too. Yeah, 
there in, in, the, in the tabernacle, they had some of the instruments, instruments had to be cleaned through a, a living yeah. water, yeah. Had, uh, running, running water. water, running water. Yeah. Running water. It got rid of contamination. <laughs> now here, uh, this well, Jacob stops at, it says that there were flee three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks. So you want to see that it's a big plain, like a wilderness type. Somebody dug a well there so that people could bring their flocks, gather could bring the flocks and gather mm -hmm. where they could water them. You had to bring the flocks where the well was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you couldn't always dig a well where the flocks were. Amen. You had to bring the flocks where the well was. Then Jesus, of course, in salvation, he told you God puts the well in you, so the well goes with you wherever you... But it's a well, it's a living, well of living water. Really yes? a second ago about the saints being refreshed with things that are fresh um, even today if you go to get a glass of cold water after you've come in from working out on a hot day you don't drink hot muddy water it's something <laughs> that's fresh and Christ doesn't Jesus um, never taught things that were stagnant he always taught things that were fresh Amen. that were refreshing to the that's people. right mm -hmm. alright now that uh that's an excellent observation, Sister Bailey. You know, a lot of people don't know this. They regularly, quote, go to church where there's just stagnant yes. stuff is served up. And, of course, you get diseases from stagnant water. It's not healthy to drink stagnant water, and it's not healthy spiritually to drink stagnant water either. <clears throat> now, there was a stone over the mouth of this well. Great, a great stone was on the well's mouth. And they rolled it off to water the flocks. They rolled it back on. Why did they do that? This is a springing well. Yeah. So they, they stopped the spring when there wasn't anybody to drink. They stopped the water from wasting and flowing out of there, see? Mm -hmm. Quite a lesson to be learned there. Yeah. I have a picture there of a, of a real well in a superimposed stone that the water sprang up out of it, so they covered it so the water wouldn't spring out of it. Remember in Revelation 21, 6, it speaks of the fountain of the water of life. It's a, yeah. see, something's living always outs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. O-U-T-S, always outs. If it's living, it gets, it, it gets out. Yeah. Water is like that. Water can go through like anything. You go through concrete. Go. Yeah. People have floods. They learn eventually water can get through anything. Yeah. And uh, that's the way this water is. We're talking about this water. If you can get where this water is, yeah. it can get through anything. Yeah. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. He, and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture said, out, out, mm -hmm. not in, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water out. Yeah. Amen. Why? Because the well. Mm -hmm. puts in, to what Jesus said to the woman at the well, the water I give you shall be in him a well. Yeah, right. And Jesus said, it, mm -hmm. so you don't want to put a stone over the mouth of this well. Amen. <laughs> You can see that, can't you? Oh, that's a wonderful truth. You also don't want to throw a bunch of earth and rock in it. That's right. That's right. Now, the thirsty soul does have to go where the water is supplied, particularly if you don't have a well inside of them. There's a sense in which the assembly of the saints is a well, a place where a well is. We like take the stone off. Yes, amen. Let it flow. Yeah. Yeah, when you're around the world, there's some things you can't, they can't flow out. Yeah. Well, when the assembly of the saints, that all stones are moved, it just flows out, see. That's the meaning of the Ephesians and Colossians text that speak about the body being together. Rather than a, of a well, it speaks about the refreshment that comes from it 
the effectual working in the maze you have ever part. So it's just, that's just output. The effectual working is the outflow mm -hmm. of the water. It's when a, the person is connected with the head and the head through him supplies the outflow of Amen. water. <clears throat> and this is a point of concern to me that this, this kind of experience is rare in the churches of refreshment. That's why they have the kind of music they have. See, the things are really dull. So they got to bring in something to hype. Because mm -hmm. things are really dull. Yeah, if, they take, if, they right, take, yeah. if they take the kids off the stage, it's really pretty dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Isn't it? I mean, everybody knows it. Oh, yeah. But rather than trying to get life, living water, mm -hmm. they, they bring entertainment in. That's the only thing to get the people kind of cranked up. See, the people of God, they're refreshed by something else, not by the world. Well, Jacob's here where the well is. The flocks are there. And Jacob wants to make sure he's in the right place. Because he, he's not sure yet. So he says, my brethren, uh, whence are you? Whence be ye? I asked the shepherds that carried for the flock this. He didn't just ask someone wandering along by the road. Where are you from? They said, where are we from? Heron. Heron. Hmm. So I could just sense the heart of, yeah. heart of Jacob. I've arrived. I'm, I'm, I'm near the territory. It's got to be nearby here. Heron. More than 70 years before this, Abraham's servant approached Heron. He, and he, he was near Heron. Almost 100 years. Almost 100. That's right. This is the place where Abraham tarried Haran when he left Ur. Remember, he tarried there, increased his possessions until God told him to move on. So this was like a sanctified uh, yeah. area by the presence. And so he said, well, do, you know, do you know Laban, uh, the son of Nahor? That one. Mm -hmm. He said, we, we know him. Oh, his heart, his heart's leaping now. Yeah. We know him. Yeah, was just, yeah we're familiar. We, we, we know him personal acquaintance with him. He says, well, is he well? That is, is he all right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't just mean, is he, is he not sick, although that's included. Mm -hmm. is, is he complete? Is he sound? Is everything going well for, them, for him? Because he's here on a mission. He wants to know about <laughs> status of Laban. Is he in peace? Would be if we want to put it in a single word. Is he in peace? Is he uncomfortable in any way? Any agitation? Tell me about Laban. They said, "Well, yes, he's he's well." Look, here comes his daughter. Here comes his daughter Rachel with his sheep. Says God. See, this is God. I see. We know this is God working. Jacob, he senses this is God working, but he's just giving you the record here. This is how God worked. Mm -hmm. Of all the times she could come, she came when mm -hmm. Jacob was there. See, timing belongs to God. That's what it means that the times and seasons belong to God. So when, when the appropriate time, when the appropriate time, that's established by God. That's not established by us. We don't establish the appropriate time. That's why I thank God at the, for the Lord's Day. That's something God yes. sanctified that so that you can expect some unusual things to happen mm -hmm. at that time. Because mm -hmm. the time belong, belong to him. So he's arrived at the proper destination, you're hearing. He's arrived at the proper time, here comes Rachel. Bringing, bringing Laban's sheep. So the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. There it is. It's, it's taught. This is an example of it. Once divine guidance has been confirmed, you don't have to spell it out. See, in all the details. Once you know this is working out for good, you, your fleshly curiosity may want to probe, but it's not necessary to do that. If you're in the heart of God's will, you don't want to ask why and what are the particular details. Just thank God you're there and take advantage of it. Be alert. 
There comes Rachel. You can evidently see her approaching with the sheep. And Laban turns to the shepherds. He's concerned that he didn't know how long these sheep have been laying there, lying there. He said, it's yet high day, because we've got a lot of, lot of daylight left. Neither is it time for the cattle to be gathered together. it would be at the evening. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. Let's take care of these sheep now. He said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together. Then they roll a stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. <laughs> Jacob, see, I could tell he's a man of God. Water the sheep. I could tell he's a man of God. Water the sheep. Amen. Be taking care of the sheep. He has a particular understanding of sheep. He himself was a shepherd. Amen. So he has a particular understanding of sheep. Some feel that Jacob said this because he anticipated Rachel coming and wanted to be coming and wanted to be alone with her. Well, I don't. It, that's a bit too carnal for me. I I don't. First wants to accept that that's their business, but I'm telling you, I don't. We we can't we can't we can't water prematurely. We can't like they may drink a. I don't know how much water flowed out of this well at one time. We can't. We've got to make it available to all the sheep that are samples to come yeah. here before we can proceed any further. We can't till they're all gathered. Well, you have quite a picture there of, of the glory and the things that are going to happen in the glory when we're with the Lord. It can't happen till we're all gathered. We've got to all be gathered together before we're going to uncap the well and let, the, let it really flow out Amen. without any hindrance at all. Amen. It's a river. River, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now this is something that all the shepherds agreed in. There was no fussing and say, well, I want, why, why can't I water my flock? And they were all agreed, the unity right. here. Yeah. All the sheep be watered. It would be nice if the shepherds today were agreed on this. All the sheep have to be watered. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute, praise team leader. All the sheep have to be watered. Yeah. Wait a minute. You take it over there to the youth church. Wait a minute. All the sheep have to be watered from the same well, not from a different well. Now there's something to be seen here. That there are times when the sheep of God's pasture are given something from God when they're gathered together. And I'll illustrate this. On one occasion, the Israelites were journeying and were thirsty. And Moses said, gather the people together, and I'll give them water. <laughs> Get them together. We're not going to hand out cupfuls one at a time, whoever comes. See, gather them together, and then we water When the law was given, that was kind of an outpouring of water. Moses said, gather me the people together, and I'll make them hear my words. It, that's what God will get the people together. For I let this start flowing, and get them all together. Yeah. For entering Canaan, Moses told the people, Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy strangers within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and they may fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of the law. For we get in that land, get them all together. Yeah. Paul wrote the Corinthians. In the name of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, 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 there's some together benefits that you don't have otherwise. Amen. There was a time when Paul wrote, of which time Paul wrote when he said, the whole church be come together into one place, <laughs> something significant. When the new covenant commenced, the announcement of what the Lord God had wrought by Christ was not made until the multitude came together. Acts 2.6 The disciples of Troas came together on the first day of the week to break bread. See, we, make a, we place a great deal of emphasis on this. We're not judging people, this sort of thing, but to expect something when we come together. Yes. There are some things provided for the church when they are assembled together. When every joint, 
began to supply Amen. at the same Amen. same place. I tell you, brother, and it's, uh, there are tremendous advantages here that we're beginning to see, but there's a lot more here, I'm convinced, than what we've seen thus far. A lot more resources are available when we're together because of the nature of the body of Christ. And what are those who keep the well kept up when the saints are together? What about those? There are people who do this. Sheep gather together, they're all together, they don't take the stone off the well. They, they play a little religion. Don't water the flock of God. What can you really say about someone who doesn't feed Christ's lambs or feed his sheep? What, what can be said in their favor? People who don't do this. What are those who ignore the word of Paul? Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. See, what about people who don't do that? They'd be like these shepherds if they didn't water those flocks. They'd be disobedient, recalcitrant shepherds. Will such insolence be overlooked by the Lord of glory? No. No, these are his sheep. He bought them. These are his sheep. He purchased. He purchased mm -hmm. this flock. Amen. And when they're not fed, he will hold in strict account mm -hmm. those who could have fed them but didn't. Mm -hmm. He'll hold them in account. Well, Rachel came with her father's sheep. While she yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep. And that into while he yet spake. He's still talking. While he's talking, this happens. That's how God works. Now, there's several of these while he yet spake statements in Scripture. The Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter said, let's build three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he yet spake cloud overshadowed him. God said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. See, God, there's some things God interrupts. When Peter denied Christ, said, I tell you, I know not the man. While he yet spake, mm -hmm. the cock crew yeah. <laughs> interrupted. <laughs> now as though interrupting the dialogue between Jacob and the shepherds, here comes Rachel with the flocks. That changes the whole discussion. Jacob, he leaps into activity right away. Notice Laban is referred to as Jacob's mother's brother three times in this verse. Came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Now, in, this is reinforced to us in words, but this impression was reinforced in Jacob by God. Mm -hmm. This is your mother's brother. Remember, your mother and your father told you to go to her brother who was Laban. Mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit's impressing in his spirit what is in, in this text. This is the Laban at your mother's brother. Mm -hmm. You're here. You're here, Jacob. Now, his response differs from the response of Abraham's servant. Abraham's servant asked God for a sign that Rebekah would water his camels. Remember, so it was kind of worked a little differently. Here, he watered mm -hmm. Laban's sheep. <laughs> it's a little bit different, but it shows that everything from God is fresh. See, yes. he rolled. Now, before it said they, they said they rolled a stone away, which would suggest it must have been a pretty good-sized stone mm -hmm. because the spring must have been had a lot of force to it coming up, see. But Jacob, he just by single-handedly rolled his stone away from the well's mouth. They said that we cannot do it till all the flocks be gathered, then they, whoever the they is, they will. But did Jacob did it himself. He's thinking of his mission, see. He's thinking of his mission. Mm -hmm. Let's get on with the mission. Now in this, we, uh, we see quite a marvelous picture of Jesus' ministry. 
when he began to minister among the people, the well of the water of life was capped off. It, it was stone. It was a, a religious philosophical stone was on top of the well when Jesus came. John the Baptist had led the people to get to the well. So there, John the Baptist got the people all gathered around the well. Yeah. Then Jesus, he removed the stone. And there was a particular time when he did. He did it in his hometown after he'd been tempted in the wilderness. He read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he began to say unto them, now he's going to take the stone off. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your, eye, in your ears. Amen. He took the stone off. And what that text meant begin to gush out. Yes. Now, throughout r religious history, theological stones have been placed on the wells of salvation, mm -hmm. <clears throat> stopping the free flow of the water of life. Mm -hmm. But God has always raised up holy men who took the stones off mm -hmm. and let the water flow. Mm -hmm. We understand that there will come a time in history, when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, and the well will be uncapped in an unprecedented way, it's going to happen. So let there be no doubt about the Lord's commitment to refresh his people. Well, Jacob, uh, he kisses Rachel, lifts up his voice and weeps. This is not a Western kiss. <laughs> It is just not connected with the lust or this sort of thing. It's not that kind of kiss. And almost always is what the kind of kiss people kiss when they talk about kiss in Western culture, you talk about romance. Yeah. That's not what this is about. This was a, a civil greeting. It was it, it's not identical, but it was closely associated with us shaking hands, welcoming. He kissed her in that way, and he left up his voice and wept. And I, th he doesn't say why he wept, but I have a persuasion he wept because thank you, Lord, you brought me to this place. I can see things coming together here now. I can see the way you're blessing me now. It was a joyful weeping that he had. Now, I want you to note the sensitivity of this man, Jacob. He has been unjustly represented as a deceiver and calloused. Yeah. Does this sound like that kind of man to you? That sees Rachel, kisses her, lifts up his voice, and weeps. This doesn't sound like a voice of a deceiver. Yeah, that's right. See, this has been an unjust mm -hmm. criticism of Jacob. <clears throat> He doesn't weep like Jacob did when he didn't receive his birthright. He lifted up his voice and he wept, but it was it was because he felt he'd been robbed. See, it was different. Then Jacob told her he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. Now, up to this point, Rachel has apparently had no idea who who Jacob was. As she appreciated the fact that he rolled a stone away and watered her sheep. But she doesn't know who Jacob is until he identifies himself. There's a lot of people who don't know who you are mm -hmm. until you identify yourself yes, in Christ. I'm your father's uh, brother. Well, <laughs> technically he was his nephew. If you want to be technical. But see, he's speaking from a different viewpoint here. He's speaking from the standpoint of a of a the progeny of Abraham. He's a brother in a sense. We were with the same bloodline traced back to Abraham. That's see, it's brother used in that sense. All those in Christ are brethren. 
not flesh and blood as normally think, but that's the kind of brother he said, I'm your father's brother because we, we both had the same bloodline. Mm -hmm. So he's not speaking of like son. Mm -hmm. He was Rebecca's son, who was Laban's sister. Thus Jacob informs Rachel of their common heritage mm -hmm. traced back to Abraham and Nahor. Mm -hmm. See, so I'm, I'm brother. I'm part, I'm part of this family. It's kind of, it's kind of small right now. <laughs> this family is going to get very large. Yeah. And Laban, he hears these things because it says Rachel went and told her father. Well, Laban hears about this. This has been a uh, long time before. <laughs> Size 100 years, as Brother Jade pointed out. He hears about it, he runs to meet him. Now, in 2003, I made a picture of a coin that was minted in Israel in 2003. That is Jacob and Rachel and the flocks in commemoration of that event, mm -hmm. 2003. This is, a t this is a coin that was minted yeah. in Israel. Yeah. And I say that to tell you there's a lot of things, no doubt, that will come together when their eyes are opened. Amen. Now this, uh, what we're reading about here at this well, this commenced a series of historical events and births that will yield the 12 tribes of Israel. They're going to result from this union. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to take, there's going to be result from meeting here. The 12 tribes are mentioned 10 times, the 12, the 12 tribes. Once in Genesis, three times in Exodus, once in Ezekiel, once in Matthew, once in Luke, once in Acts, once in James, and once in Revelation. Twelve tribes. They're also referred to as the whole house of Israel. Mm -hmm. Five times in Scripture. 152 times they're referred to as the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel meaning Jacob's name changed. 46 times they're referred to as the tribes of Israel. 122 times they're referred to as the house of Israel. 19 times they're referred to as the people of Israel. 644 times they're referred to as the children of Israel. 230 times are referred to as the Jews. So here's a body of people who are directly referenced in Scripture 1,158 times. It's all starting at this well. Yeah, amen. That's right. Despise not the day. Mm -hmm. A small beginning. So <laughs> the whole matter now is beginning to develop this great purpose that God has purposed is beginning to develop. God is carefully preserving the seed of Abraham. That's mm -hmm. right, Amen. That that's the mean that Jesus is going to be the seed yeah. that comes from Abraham. Amen. And so he's carefully preserving the seed. And once you know that Satan is in the background trying to destroy this seed, mm -hmm. well, Laban heard these things. This is the record of Laban. Laban responding to Rachel's report said he heard these things. She went to tell Laban. That's what he, the text is referring to. Laban heard what Rachel said. It had been about 97 years since Laban had seen Rebecca. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a little more. <laughs> but he hadn't forgot her. He remembered her. It's a long time, brethren. Yeah. Long time. Your memory can reach way back. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can. We don't know if he ever did know she had children. Maybe she did. Maybe he did. Maybe the word got her out. We don't know for sure. But then uh, Jacob told Laban all these things. There's various views of this, what all these things, what that meant. Some was he told him everything was necessary to attest he was a kin. Some feel he told him the entire story of his life, everything. Or things related to the immediate context. 
It seems to me that the emphasis here is Jacob is established, and he's part of the kinfolk, and then he is establishing the promise made to Abraham and make it connect in all these. He's representing the Lord in this. Laban, uh, here's what he said, and he says, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. I want to explore that a little bit. Thou art my bone and my flesh. Remember, this is what Adam said when Eve was presented to him by God. He said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. <clears throat> Therefore, they were one flesh. Adam himself said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. One flesh is a summary of bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Jesus also confirmed that this is a proper description of marriage, Matthew 19. This expression, bone, you are my bone and my flesh, this expression was used later to denote legitimate relationship. When Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, said to his mother's brothers, I am your bone and your flesh. When the tribes of Israel once came to David and said, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. David sent a message to the elders of Israel saying, Ye are my bones and my flesh. So this is a legitimate terminology. It's being established way back, yeah. way back here. The same language is employed but as describing God's people and Christ. In Ephesians 5.30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. There, there it is again. So in salvation through faith, there is a legitimate relationship accomplished between Christ and his people. It's legitimate and recognized by God. Flesh, Christ, flesh, and bone, so to speak. Let's say it another way. This is not just a metaphorical. There is something of Jesus that is in every believer just as surely as something from Adam was in Eve. Yes, amen. That's right. Bone, his uh, bone, yeah. and his flesh. Mm -hmm. All believers possess a new man, yeah. which is described as a, after God being created in righteousness and true holiness. That's something from Christ is in uh -huh. that person. Renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Mm -hmm. Something of the redeemers in the redeemed. Yeah. Yeah. Now believers are also, they partake of, they partake of Christ. Mm -hmm. Just like Eve partook of Adam. Mm -hmm. For instance, we have the spirit of Christ. Yeah. That's right. We have the mind of Christ. Yeah. We participate in the sufferings of Christ. And we emit the savor of Christ. And both the dying of the Lord Jesus and the life of Jesus are manifested in our mortal flesh. And we're made partakers of Christ. See, all that's flesh. Amen. We have his flesh and of his bones. All goes back to this language. See, he's, he's establishing a way to communicate to people what we are in Christ. Amen. It's established a way back there. When that makes sense back there, it'll make sense up here. In Christ, and it's just it's just not a paper transaction, so, yeah. so to speak. This is very real transaction where God takes something from Jesus mm -hmm. and puts in you. Yes. Cool. Uh -huh. Oh, that's marvelous. Really given an adoption, it can only go so far in 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 the flesh and blood realm. I mean, you can adopt some of it. They don't really become like you. They can benefit from your resources. Yeah. But they are not really no. genetically yours. But in Christ, it yeah. changes. Yeah, adoption. See, that's that's another facet of redemption. This is this is a deeper, yeah. a deeper facet. The adoption has to do with the legality yeah. of the whole thing, mm -hmm. and the right to the inheritance. Mm -hmm. But here, this is dealing with you actually participate. You partake of Christ. Amen. You right. actually do. Uh -huh. He makes you out of what. He was in Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Now that's uh, is recognized by by myself too that Jacob during the time he's uh, with Laban he's productive. He's just not like lounging in the living room someplace. He's he's productive, thoughtful and considerate. That was Jacob's real nature. See, his real nature wasn't to try and take somebody in or deceive somebody. That's right. That was not his nature. Amen. So he stayed, he stayed with him a, a month, 30 days, a month. And at the end of the month, Laban says to Jacob, because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Well, so he was, well, yeah, you always do. You know, you never ask your relatives. You never pay your relatives. Your relatives always give it to you, you know. See, that is, that is not the way they thought. Tell me what shall be thy wages. As I said, ordinarily a relative would be expected to work for nothing. And if that's what you choose, we, we don't condemn anybody. I just bring, God doesn't expect you to work for nothing either. This is not expected in the kingdom of God. God has laborers worthy of his hire. Again, keep in mind that brother does not refer to an immediate relative. Now let's have a brief lesson on brotherhood. Now there's the brotherhood of Adam. That, that takes us all in. In the flesh, there's the brotherhood of Adam. And there's another more fun that the brotherhood of Abraham, who is the father of us all in Christ. And there's a brotherhood of Satan's children, children of the wicked one. See, they have a brotherhood too. And there's a brotherhood of Jesus. See, there's, these are large brotherhoods. They're not like household brotherhoods. They're, they're large brotherhoods. Now, the concept of relatives did exist in uh, Jewish families. You had the brother, you had the family of Ishmael and the family of Esau and so forth. But it was based on being, upon there being such a thing as a chosen race. When we talk about God's people, brother, you are my brother, based on the fact that back there someplace God chose somebody. And whoever's related to that person God chose is a brother. Now, it's really necessary to see this. Whether men know it or not, every person in Christ Jesus is fraternally related to every other person that's in Christ. That's the way it is. Now, for some of us, it took quite a while to kind of get a grasp of what this was because sectarianism, some called denominationalism, or Babylon the Great robs people of this. It makes you think and to your brother is someone that sees things exactly like you see them. And that's not, that's not the use of the word. The reality is what undergirds certain, the reality of a real unity in the family of God undergirds a lot of statements in Scripture. One is having love one for another. See, it's not just that that's a, something you've got to do. There's something that undergirds that. We really are part of the same family. We really are brethren. And there's confirming knowledge. By this you'll know that you're my disciples. Well, all men know you're my disciples, and you have love one for another. So the how we treat each other confirms to the outsider that we're Christ's disciples. And there's, there's divine tutelage of this. This is a kind of love you have to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9. So who does God teach you to love? Neighbor down the street? That in a sense, I can, we, we don't say that that's not possible. That's not the, the thrust. That's not the thrust of it. Mm -hmm. God teaches you to love his people. Because yes. you'll be no closer to God's people than you love them. To the degree that you love them and prefer them, to that degree you'll spend mm -hmm. quality time with them, mm -hmm. seek to benefit them, take advantage of the benefits they have. So as Abraham's offspring is a result of being a chosen people, 
everything is traced back to a single source. In Abraham, in the Jews, it's traced back to Abraham. Mm -hmm. In the New Covenant, it's traced back to Christ. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ultimately, the connection with Christ is what makes you a brother to everybody else. Amen. But what if you are unsure about your association with Christ? What if, what if you're not sure what, what your identity with Christ really is, which a lot of real believers mm -hmm. aren't sure about this because they haven't been taught properly? Mm -hmm. This affects how close you are to God's people. Yes, a person who doesn't know they're God's child will tend to be one in the flesh with people because mm -hmm. they don't know this deeper association. That's why people have to establish like Jacob did. I'm, I'm your brother, your, your brother's sister's son. Mm -hmm. yes, that's why he established that because he knew nobody from Laban's house was going to hobnob with somebody that was of a heathen heritage. Mm -hmm. This wasn't going to happen. Jacob knew it wasn't going to happen. Jacob didn't want it to happen. So he's just establishing the proper bloodline. What will your wages be? Well, you probably have not been asked that question. <laughs> the manager didn't come to you and say, what would you like me to pay you? It's what Laban did. That's what he did. I think Laban knew this is my brother. They're not going to try and take advantage of me here. I can, I can, I can be straightforward about this. What would you like your wages to be? Well, Laban had uh, two daughters. It appeared as though at the time Abraham's servant went for Isaac's wife, it appears as though. Uh, Bethuel only had one daughter. It appears that way. Laban had two. Two. Now there's something of note here. <clears throat> Since sin entered into the world, the offspring, the, the pro progenitors lived less and the offspring were fewer. Got kind of diminished. Now at the first it wasn't that way. For instance, Adam begat sons and daughters for 800 years. That's what it says. Seth begat sons and daughters for 807 years. Enos begat sons and daughters for 815 years. Canaan did it for 840 years. I'm establishing a pattern here. Mahaliel did it for 830 years. Jared begat many daughters for 800 years. Enoch did it for 300 years because God took him, remember, in his teens he was taken. Methuselah did it for 782 years. Lamech begat sons and daughters for 599 years. Just started to diminish, see? Shem did it for 500 years. Arphaxad did it for 403 years. Selah did it for 403 years. Eber did it for 430 years. Peleg did it for 209 years. By the time you get down to... Aru did it for 207 years. Sabrek did it for 200 years. And Nahor did it for 119 years. And sons and daughters. I think for that many years, you get sons and daughters. Now you get down to Laban, two daughters. <laughs> yeah. Now see the... Judgment of mortality it yes, was setting in, took yes. took effect. Lifespan went down, number of daughters began to be narrowed down, but the divine choice still governed. When there were a lot of sons, a lot of daughters, God selected. When there were a few, God still selected. So he had two two daughters. Mm -hmm. Leah was tender eyed. Well, well, what does that mean, tender-eyed? Well, we'll turn to the other versions. They'll, they'll clear it up for us. Quite a number of them says tender-eyed. Significant numbers say, uh, say delicate, or she has delicate eyes. A great number of verses say that she had weak eyes. 
Some person said she had lovely eyes. These are Bibles now. People read. Basic Bible English said she had clouded eyes. The Standard Bible says she had ordinary eyes. Douay version says she had blear eyes. God's Word says she had attractive eyes. New American Bible says she had dull eyes. The New Living Translation says she had no sparkle in her eyes. English Revised Standard Version says she had gentle eyes. International Standard Version says she had rather plain eyes. Message Bible says she had nice eyes. Amplified Bible says she had weak and dull looking eyes. The meaning of the Hebrew word translated tender is not really that clear. It's used in Scripture 17 times. I give you the various uses of it. I won't take time to read it. What did he mean? See, now there are some things in Scripture you just have to resort to thinking, examining the text, and, and seeing what you got to work with, and you can't take shortcuts. There's just some... Some things you can't do that with. All right, now I want her eyes. I mean, it's a particular point of her eyes. Now, among each, each of the women, they veiled their faces. And uh, we know I, I, Rebecca, or, yeah, Rebecca veiled her face because she put her veil on when she met Jacob. And I got a picture on page 14 at the bottom of some of those veils. Now look at that well pictures and think she had tender eyes. It, it makes a little more sense. See, that's all you could see of her. Yeah. She was a, and she was attractive in her eyes. She had sen tender, sensitive eyes. See, mm -hmm. this probably you say. What about Rachel? Well, she'd been communicating with her father. Maybe she'd been telling him. So she probably removed the veil, mm -hmm. so you could see more of her countenance. But this is this is probably all you saw of mm -hmm. Leah. But she apparently was attractive in her eyes. That's what I'm going to. Mm -hmm. You saw her sense, tender and sensitive eyes. Mm -hmm. Said, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now these these translations are right. I like a, a little more modest translation, but here's what they say. She was a beautiful form and appearance, beautiful of form of face. Lovely in form and beautiful, fair in face and in form, he had a beautiful figure and was good looking, beautiful figure and beautiful features, beautiful in appearance and exceedingly fair in countenance, beautiful and attractive. All right, now what, uh, what kind of figure did she have? Well, the concept of a beautiful woman and the figures changed over the years. Like Solomon in Song of Solomon 7 2, I won't read it, <laughs> describes a beautiful woman. And she wasn't a slim, trim, walk the aisle model type yeah, person. Right, yeah. So you, when you think of Rachel, don't think of her in terms of Western culture. Yeah, yeah. She was an attractive, comely mm -hmm. woman in both form in face or countenance as compared to, Ray, to Leah who was her eyes all we had any knowledge of of her and also the way women of the East dressed uh, doesn't accent the figure yeah, that's right. even today mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to tell what the person looks like actually Jacob says, um, I'll work seven years for Rachel. S seven years. Now, brethren, some of you probably haven't had the job you got for seven years yet. So I'll work seven years. He loved Rachel. This was God drawing him to her. This was the woman. See, this was the woman. Behind the scenes, God is working everything together for good. So this was the woman... And so God worked this in Jacob. He, he was attracted to Rachel. Yeah. Loved her in, in an honorable, honorable way. 
The purpose, yes. Uh, you could have, would be way out of line to say that he had heard the story of what happened with his father. And, yeah. the, and the servant and how God had brought yeah. the woman. And so you, it's kind of, you can kind of see at the well that he was expecting this kind of a thing. And it happened. It happened Here she yeah. comes. And so it, 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 to him, I can just see how this made yeah. perfectly good sense. Lord Lennon. And he had had, he had had some, <clears throat> some history of the Lord working. That's right. Yeah. That's right. He'd heard that the Lord yeah. led the servant. Yeah. Now this, uh. You sir, uh, mm -hmm. I'll serve you for seven years. Mm -hmm. And Laban, uh, Laban said, uh, "Well, it's better I give her to thee than I should give her to another man that buys with me." So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll settle for that. And so Jacob, he served seven years, and that's all you know about the seven years. Yeah. This is all you know about that seven-year span. Mm -hmm. Is he served, worked? For mm. seven years to have Rachel, you don't know one single thing that happened during those seven years. Mm -hmm. Twenty-three words summarize seven years. Yeah. <laughs> Remarkable. Mm. And Israel, in Hosea mentions this. The prophet Hosea mentions this. In Hosea 12:12, 12, 12, and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. Tells you what he did for seven years. So you see, God again, he covers only what's relevant to his, mm -hmm. to his purpose. That's why it's wrong to get entangled in the affairs of this life. Yeah. See, there were some, quote, affairs of this life during those seven years. Mm -hmm. But Jacob didn't get entangled in them. He's thinking all seven years, he's mm -hmm. thinking about Rachel. Mm -hmm. Who he's going to have at the end of those seven years. Now we're learning from this the importance of a fundamental quest. Mm -hmm. A primary quest. Mm -hmm. Jacob's primary quest was finish out this seven years, get Rachel, go back to the promise. Yeah. So in view of this, Jesus established it. This is the kingdom way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Make that your primary quest. Mm -hmm. Your tenure in this world is like Jacob's seven years mm -hmm. in Mesopotamia. Yeah. And Jesus talked about establishing priorities. Mm -hmm. Jacob's priority was get Rachel for your wife. Mm -hmm. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's Jesus said that. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that's got to be taken. Seriously, every person's got to uh -huh. apply it to themselves. Mm -hmm. We can't apply it to one another. We can announce this is what the king said. Mm -hmm. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You do have to labor. Yes. Jacob didn't sit for seven years. Mm -hmm. He worked for seven years. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Jacob couldn't quit after six years and think he's going to get his wife. He had to work the full seven years. See, in Christ it's all or nothing. Whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, it's all or nothing. That's how Jacob had to work hard every day for seven years in anticipation of obtaining Rachel. He had to avoid any kind of entanglements, any fussing with some of the heathen shepherds or something like that. He had to not get caught up in that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Maybe a war would break out. Can't get caught up in that. i got to work mm -hmm. for my wife. Now, this isn't an area where we can make laws, you know, and regulations, special procedures. on how a person does this, establish priorities, how they live. That's... That's what you've got to work out. You've got to work out your own salvation mm -hmm. with fear and trembling. This is not something somebody else can do for you. Nobody can do Jacob's work for him. Mm -hmm. He had to do the work. That's right. In anticipation of receiving. You no, know, what a Jacob, what do you what do you think? They worked seven years? That's <laughs> that's uh two thousand five hundred and twenty days. Mm -hmm. 
It's a 60,480 hours. Yeah. Actually, your, your, your service has been longer than that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've worked a lot longer than seven years mm -hmm. to be part of this bride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no regrets. Yes. Amen. I trust that you don't either. Amen. See, there are some things worth working and waiting for. Yes. Amen. We're in the posture of a pilgrim, brethren. We're pilgrims. Yeah. Like Jacob was. He was in a strange land. He wasn't in the promised land when this was going on. He was in Haran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While we're in the world, we're strangers and pilgrims. We're solemnly charged to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Start anticipating the wedding now. Mm -hmm. Start looking forward to the marriage now. The secret to a proper perspective of of time is for the church to have an increasing and consistent love for the bridegroom. That's what causes time to be life to be bearable. Mm -hmm. yeah. You take this out of the equation and quite frankly life can become very burdensome. Mm -hmm. We can't. Yeah. There's things that take place in, in our lives that are very hard to be born. If you, if you take the factor of being joined to the Lord out of the picture then that, that makes it all very difficult. Mm -hmm to live, but, but it does not need to be taken out of the picture. As our love for the Savior increases and anticipation grows, the days of our pilgrimage <coughs> begin to shorten. Mm -hmm. And here's a, this, it says of uh, Jacob that it, it seemed but just for the love he had for Rachel, it seemed just a few days. The seven years just, mm -hmm. why, 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 it just seemed like just a few days. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he was, Rachel was there. Yes. She wasn't there as his wife, but she was there. He could see her. Mm -hmm. Perhaps he could commune with her once in a while. For the love he had for Rachel, seven years just went. That's right. I can tell you, brother, that mm. life is that way. Mm -hmm. As of December uh, 24, mm -hmm. 2012, I will have been in the Lord for 70 years. A few of those years were spent in vanity. I just, God give me grace to forget them, but they passed rather swiftly. Mm -hmm. I think back up and I say, well, it's, it does. It just seems like a few days, it just seemed like not long ago I was a young man. Mm -hmm. What what makes it that way? It's not an imagination. That's right. It's that as your love for Christ grows, time begins to, sh mm -hmm. to shrink mm -hmm. in your perception. Mm -hmm. and a lot of things that are otherwise difficult and arduous, and like a long time, you, pretty soon they, they don't seem long at all for the love that you have for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I do, I covet that for everybody. Mm -hmm. To have that kind of love for Jesus that it reduces the significance of some of the mm -hmm. more difficult experiences of life. Yeah. You, we all, you all have some difficult things that are hard to be born. I mean, uh -huh. we can't pretend like they're not there. But when you have this love for Christ and you're anticipating being forever with the Lord, it does have an impact on how you see time. Mm -hmm. Amen. And how you see inconveniences and hurts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. labor and difficulties. They just look different. Yes. That's how it was with Jacob. He must have had some trying experiences during mm -hmm. those seven years with mm -hmm. you. They're not mentioned at all, not because there weren't any, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Sure there were some. Mm -hmm. But it's his love for Rachel. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Even though he she wasn't his wife, mm -hmm. the anticipation of her being his wife mm -hmm. increased his love. Mm -hmm. Now there's a sense now which we're absent from the Lord. Mm -hmm. While we're in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Mm -hmm. But during that time, our anticipation can grow and our love can, yes, amen. can grow. Now let's, let's close with a consideration of uh, Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came to earth from age to up to age 30 was like the one month. <laughs> That's right. that Jacob was 
lived with Laban mm -hmm. for one month. That was that, that first 30 years were like that one month. Mm -hmm. But then those three and a half years, mm -hmm. that was like the seven years. Yeah. <laughs> what was Jesus doing when he was going about doing good and healing all the repressed of the devil? He was laboring mm -hmm. for his bride. Yes, yeah. amen. Yeah. That's what he was doing. Yeah. Uh -huh. You see, John the Baptist said, the, he talked about the bridegroom. The bridegroom has the bride. And he talked about this. And Jesus mm -hmm. heard him preach about this. Mm -hmm. He didn't bribe him the bridegroom and the bride them until that lay his ministry was, there was some compassion in it. I understand that. Mm -hmm. There was concern in it. I can understand that. But deeper down, deep down in where the fresh water flows, mm -hmm. there was this anticipation of getting the bride. Yes, amen. And he... He ministered so that when you read about it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so that when you read about Jesus' life in Matthew, Mark, and John, mm -hmm. if you read it right, you'll pick up on Jesus' anticipation mm -hmm. of being with his people. Mm -hmm. Amen. He'll let it leak out every once in a while mm -hmm. in a parable mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. that he's anticipating. Mm -hmm. And his love for you is increasing. Mm -hmm. And we trust that your love for him is, in, Amen. is increasing too. Amen. Well, I probably could have given you a lot more, but I, I've just given you what I can. <laughs> what I can. And there's a lot in that text. Amen. It's like orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The text is like orientation. Mm -hmm. It's teaching you about God, about his manners, about mm -hmm. Christ, about his manners, about what it means mm -hmm. to wait, what it means to love, what it means to work. Mm -hmm. It's all mm -hmm. embedded in that, in that text. Yeah. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yeah. Yeah, but again, this, um, it, it, this is, you can see this. That um, here, here he comes to this well. Now this is hot off the heels of this dream. That's right. Which, which you know, before the dream here, he's leaving a bad situation. His brother wants to kill him. Yeah. You know, things have been misunderstood about him, and and he has to flee. And yet God, like sets things, sets his thinking right with this dream, yeah. and then prepares him for what's going to happen at the well. Yeah, amen. <laughs> this is good stuff. Yes, that number seven is also a very significant number in the scriptures because mm -hmm. yeah. it bespeaks of the completeness or perfection of something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've already alluded to Christ here. See, after seven years, then he obtained his wife. Mm -hmm. See, that's the way it is with Christ Jesus. Yeah. It's when the bride had made herself ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when the Get marriage is mm -hmm. yeah, That's right. Place. Amen. Anyone else tonight? Striking to me the, the things that, and, and this becomes more prominent in my in my observation of the scripture and thinking about the scripture all the time. Yeah. The things that are, both the things that are recorded and the things that are not recorded. <laughs> what mm -hmm. you began the lesson with, thinking yeah. about, you know, the, the focus and the emphasis of, of yeah. what mm -hmm. the Spirit is uh, delivering to us. That, yes, that he amen. intends for us to know. That he intends for us to understand the, inf the information that is granted to us and the focus and emphasis of that information is unique. Oh, amen. Amen. Not like the world. It's, it's not written like a human... You know, there are no human interest... Yes. There's no human interest information like, That's right. like human authors. Yeah. Uh, you know, when they, when they do a biography of someone, they add all this information and they give this and they give that and it goes on and on mm -hmm. and on about and there's nothing like that in the scripture no mm -hmm. it, it be, yeah. the primary worker is mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. not, the, not the people yeah yeah, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, those who um, mm -hmm. uh, insist on making patterns they would say mm -hmm. well in order for him to go get a wife he's going to have to saddle some some camels he has to take a lot of treasure with him because this is what the story that he Sir, heard. Sir did, yeah. So, so he he would have done that. So that's how you go get a wife from Mesopotamia. But see, this is not at all. God doesn't work like this. Yeah. So he his experience was totally unique that's because right. his work was going to be totally that's unique. That's right. He was hasting away. He didn't yeah. have time to gather all this. <laughs> yeah. He brought nothing but himself.
himself. Yeah. That's right. He traveled 600 miles. That's yeah. right. Just himself. Yeah. Right? But himself. That he didn't go back by himself. That's right. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, have a word. Yes. Um, I was very blessed by this thought that you had that as our love for the Savior increases and our participation grows, mm -hmm. the days of our pilgrimage begin to shorten. Um, part of the reason why that is is that our focus is on the Savior, and the whole point in focusing on something is you lose sight of everything else. Mm -hmm. um, because our focus is on Him, the things of this world aren't that important anymore and really aren't that memorable um, and also with with Jacob um, laboring for Rachel for seven years, it's it's sort of the same idea as we are now, except we're laboring to make ourselves ready to be the bride of Christ, mm -hmm. and that when we finally reach the end of our pilgrimage, not only will we come to the true realization that the things we went through here <coughs> really weren't that bad, but that we will be forever joined with the Lord, and we will finally be able to say, I am my beloved, so my beloved is mine. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes, yeah, Sister Mary. I can also see a picture in this uh, description of Rachel, that she is beautiful and well-favored. Yes, well-favored. Uh, the, the church is beautiful to Christ. Yes, and, amen. And is well-favored well by favored. him. Well-favored. So I, I see this description as being something... That, like Jacob's view of her, she was beautiful, and he he had a great favor towards her. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our heavenly Father, we're very grateful for the revelation of our father Jacob, and to see the focus of his life and his intent on obtaining a proper wife. Now he prefigured our Lord Jesus Christ, who also is intent upon his bride being with him. We thank you that you've established your own will as the, the will with the priority, the most significant will. And we, we admit, Father, that it is our desire that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.